giving the right people a platform to speak authentically and share their heart can really resonate. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Sharing Passion and Purpose podcast. My name is Nancy Moore, and I am the host of this weekly podcast that provides career and creative inspiration to help you build a passionate and purpose-filled life. You'll hear from guests that will help you tap into your creative potential, pursue a career with passion, and build on your biggest and best resource, yourself. I'm excited to have you join this conversation. I'm so happy you're here. Let's get started. Okay, you guys, I am so happy to let you know that I have Luke Lifesty on this episode. Luke made an international name for himself working his way up from a student at NYU to senior entertainment editor of well-known publications GQ and Architectural Digest. Luke worked with everyone from prominent celebrities and pop stars to public figures. It was really a life that he worked hard to achieve, but towards the end of his time at these publications, he struggled with feelings of unfulfillment before he made a life-changing decision to alter his life and career trajectory. During this visit, you're going to find out more from this proud Tulsa native, what changed for him, as well as his feelings and perspective on his professional achievements and his transition back to Tulsa. You'll also hear more about the current projects that he's working on, which are pretty cool. So I'm excited to have you learn more about that. So here is my conversation with Luke Lifesty. Okay, the Conversations with Passion and Purpose live podcast event is only a few weeks away. The next one is Friday, November 8th, and there are still a few tickets left. My guest will be Carissa Miller, founder and CEO of Carissa Miller Design Co., In only eight years, Carissa has successfully created and scaled a multi-million dollar interior design business using the power of social media. Although she doesn't have any formal training in this area, that didn't stop her. To give you an idea of her talent, she has been nominated for HGTV's Designer of the Year three times, and her work has been featured in national publications. If you have a dream in your heart and want to take action, this event is for you. She will share the details of building her business and encourage women to push through the fear and do it scared. You can purchase tickets directly through my website, sharingpassionandpurpose.com. If you're in the Tulsa area, I would love to see you there. (laughs) (laughs) We're going to have fun. Okay, Luke Lifesty, I am so happy to have you with me on the podcast today. Welcome. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you for creating this space for authentic, vulnerable conversation. Yeah. Well, I'm ready to have an authentic, vulnerable conversation with you. Me too. And it's going to be more than 90 seconds. Your normal <laughs> uh, interviews that you do with all these amazing people around Tulsa, It's they're quick, they're informative, they're cool, they're fun. Uh, but So yeah, ours is going to be a little bit longer. So I always like to have people uh, kind of know the person I'm talking to in their own words. So if you could tell people a little about yourself. Absolutely. I think the first thing about me is that I'm a proud native Tulsan. And that is an important thing to say because I'm a recent boomerang from New York City where I spent the last 12 years of my life and worked across network news, broadcast television, and magazine publishing. And That was a gift, uh, being able to experience all the things that I got to experience all in my 20s was a great privilege. But now I'm really happy to be back. Um, A lot of people know me as the guy who worked at GQ, Architectural Digest. I was an NBC page, just like Kenneth from 30 Rock, Bangs and All. And I'm a graduate of NYU, New York University. 
I'm very proud to actually be working on the NYU Tulsa project now, promoting Tulsa as an opportunity for NYU students to come study away here, which is an incredible full circle moment that I could have never anticipated, but very life-giving to be a part of that. But overall, I'm just a kid from Tulsa, and I will say Booker T really shaped me, going to Booker T, going to Carver. Uh, that's why I am the way I am. That's why I have empathy for people outside of this area that I grew up in, Maple Ridge. I have empathy for people from all areas of Tulsa, from all different backgrounds and all socioeconomic levels. And I'm so grateful to my parents for sending me to public schools. I went to Eisenhower as well. Public school K through 12, which I can't recommend enough. I know I know TPS is going through a lot right now, but there are a lot of bright spots in our public education system here. I also think public education is the, the backbone of our society and our city here in Tulsa. So I'm just grateful for, for all those experiences that shaped me. Okay, I love that. <laughs> so something that struck me about you is that you set out at a young age, 18 is young, to be moving to New York. And then, you know, you make contacts and connections, and you had a bucket list, or should I say bucket list or goals, that you wanted to achieve, and you have ticked off so many of those items. And you mentioned being at GQ, you you know, just different mm -hmm. um, things that you've been able to achieve. And if you could just kind of share a little bit about what it was like to be an Oklahoma boy in New York. I remember one of my first days of class at NYU. Yeah. We went we went around and the the professor said, "Everyone please introduce yourself and and say where you're from." And it was like London, LA, Beijing, and then I was like Tulsa. <laughs> And everyone was like, what? You know, people didn't have any conception of Oklahoma, of Tulsa, really of the middle of, of the country. And NYU, especially being a very international school, just like um, New York is a very international city. So I was constantly forced to kind of explain where I was from and what that meant, which was a great exercise for me because I love talking about Tulsa and Oklahoma and what makes it so special. Yeah. It's kind of cool that that you achieved all that you did I guess building your own network and in you know working really hard. I know you probably have that really strong work ethic and you know going up and achieving because you achieved some big things in New York. So if you could just kind of tell people a little bit about how you did that like maybe from college mm -hmm. on to where you were, you know, at I'll, GQ. I'll start by saying I'm a recovering hyperachiever. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's one of the things I've sort of worked through a little bit because that was sort of how I operated. I mean, honestly, since growing up and through high school is hyper achievement. I say hyper achievement because it was just a little bit in overdrive, okay. um, maybe to my own detriment. But yeah, when I got to New York, I, I knew I wanted to work in media news. I was kind of a political junkie. So my first internship was at NBC Universal, working in the news division. So I started off at CNBC and then at MSNBC. And then my dream job was to be in the NBC Page program, which is a program that's been around for 80 years. And it's kind of this legacy in the media industry where they bring in the cream of the crop and you kind of are just thrown right into the belly of the beast at 30 Rock. And you get to work for all these different iconic entities and you're with all these other hyperachievers one year out of college and it's an incredible opportunity and that really shaped me because getting that level of experience at that age I mean I was working at Saturday Night Live when I was 22 or 3 years old and interacting with everyone from Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump and Adele and Tracy Morgan and Tina Fey and all these people that were there hosting because as the page there, we would have to escort the host and the musical guest and pick up their salads and stuff like that. But 
I bring that up because that sort of put me on the trajectory to um, Condé Nast and GQ and Architectural Digest, where I worked for seven years. And I got to check a lot of boxes, like you mentioned, things I had always wanted to do. And that was a great privilege because then it allowed me to be able to step away from that and recalibrate. I sort of came to a point where I was thinking to myself, what ladder am I climbing? Is this the ladder I want to be climbing? Maybe I want to get off this ladder and climb a different one. So A little soul searching at a young age. Mm-hmm. And we can thank the pandemic for that. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, I remember I was so impressed with an article that you wrote about Tulsa. And I think you were probably thinking at that time um, about moving back to Tulsa. But it was in... Now, we're, I'm trying to remember if it New was... New York Magazine. New York Magazine. My, fav- my favorite publication. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, I just loved everything. You you talked about all these great spots in Tulsa and um, brought so much interest to Tulsa because, you know, this is a great place to be. Mm-hmm. And I love that you have come back here. And that's probably a good segue into what you're doing now because um, with through the pandemic is that when you kind of decided this is it's time to make a shift and then kind of positioned yourself to come back yeah so I landed here during the pandemic unexpectedly as many people did um, because of an offer to come stay at a house with a pool and a hot tub, which sounded a lot better than staying in dystopian New York City at the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I hopped on an empty Southwest flight and came down here. And to give you an idea of where I was at at the time in relationship to Tulsa, I remember saying out loud, I can't imagine being here for one month. I had a, I had a return flight a month from that date, and I couldn't imagine being in Tulsa for one month because I'd only been here for holidays up until that point. Of course, that flight got canceled and I ended up staying for almost a year at the time. And what that allowed me to do was reconnect with my hometown. And it really, I think more than anything, allowed me, you know, being away from New York, being away from my job and the persona that I had built and felt like I had to live up to, I was able to explore other parts of myself that had been latent for a while kind of more of my entrepreneurial side, my inner leader, like wanting to make a change uh, on a big scale in my hometown. And so I ended up meeting all these people and I just felt so energized by what I discovered was happening here on the ground. I knew from afar there was stuff happening, but to really touch down with it um, face to face and, and meet all these change makers locally, I was very inspired and very energized. So when I went back to New York for a couple more years, Tulsa was in the back of my mind and I didn't know what to do about that because it was kind of two ends of a spectrum. I'd be on a cover shoot for GQ with like a huge celebrity and I'm thinking to myself, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. I can't believe I'm here. At the same time, I'm thinking to myself, this doesn't really fill me up. So what do you do with that? (laughs) Uh, that was a little bit confusing for me. And I heard my friend talking about this concept of the zone of genius. Have you heard about this? Mm -mm. I think it's Gay Hendricks who wrote the book on it. Uh, I highly recommend it to pretty much anyone. I think it's a super fascinating idea that we all have a zone of genius. And he kind of builds out four quadrants, zone of genius, zone of excellence, zone of competence, zone of incompetence, and asks you to kind of audit your time and figure out where things fall in that in that quadrant and most of us end up in the zone of excellence for an, our entire lives and the zone of excellence is kind of tricky because it is often celebrated by society mm-hmm. financially stable which mm-hmm. kind of keeps you in that space and it's something you're better at than most people so you kind of feel like okay I'm, I'm pretty set right now, but it's not truly the highest wavelength you can be operating on. It's one step away from sort of stepping into your purpose as fueled by your passion mm-hmm. and doing the thing that only you uniquely can do, which obviously 
brings up a, a bunch of upper limits and beliefs subconsciously that you have to work through, which mm-hmm. is why you're stuck in the zone of excellence. Anyway, I bring this up because I heard my friend talking about that. And mm-hmm. I was like, I need to learn more about this. Where did you learn this? And she said, I'm, I'm working with this transformational coach. Here she is. And uh, I called her up. She had a spot open. And I said, please, I need to get, <laughs> I need to talk to you about some stuff. So over the course of six months, she kind of cracked me open. I had never been to therapy at this point. As you know, I'm That's the son ironic. of as you know, I'm the son of a therapist, so we can talk about that later. Yeah. But um, part two, working with this transformational coach cracked me open. I was pretty closed off emotionally, not in touch with my emotions, not in touch with my body, what I was feeling, and she forced me to process a lot of that, and also to realize, to come to the realization that my ego and my identity were so enmeshed with my job. They were enmeshed with my job and where I lived, New York. So you can imagine being an editor at GQ, Architectural Digest, it kind of, it's a, it creates this validation loop externally that you don't even realize is happening Mm -hmm. um, just by nature of the work and the spaces you're in and the people you're with. And you kind of get stuck in this cycle of, looking for that validation as it comes externally. I will say it's, uh, you know, typically people will say when they meet you, you know, when you, after you say your name, they'll say, oh, and what do you do? So it's easy right. also to get caught up because to have the notoriety of I'm an editor at GQ mm-hmm. or, you know, something like that, it's kind of like, wow. Yeah. That, you know. And so, it is awesome. It's and the, an, it's the a, financial. Yeah. The, that, those golden handcuffs. Yeah. Golden yeah. handcuffs. That's how people, a lot of people describe working at Condé Nast because okay. you're overworked and underpaid. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I think we were paid um, pretty well, but that is the case for a lot of people. And honestly, for most of my time there, you are overworked and overpaid, but that's kind of the that's the trade-off for Mm -hmm. working in those spaces. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I realized that the reason why I was leaning on my job in terms of identity so much was actually because I hadn't done enough processing about my personal journey as it related to coming out. And so GQ and New York and all this was providing a lot of external armor for me. Mm to have power and influence over other people that didn't where I didn't have to actually be showing up authentically Mm -hmm. and being vulnerable which my nervous system read that as very unsafe at the time Mm -hmm. Um, so I was really again not even consciously leaning on my job and where I lived as my identity and at that moment when I went through the decoupling of all that I knew there was a misalignment um, and I knew there was a need for a change and this Tulsa insight that I had I just had to work through all that and I had an ego death moment Mm -hmm. and literally it was like the clouds dissipated and I saw Tulsa up in the sky (laughs) and I was like this is not what I was expecting to, to find out, to be honest. I thought I was going to leave my job, maybe move to L.A. and explore a different type of career, maybe in another area of entertainment. But as soon as I saw Tulsa, I felt a sense of clarity that I hadn't felt in about a decade. And at that moment, I was able to move very quickly in terms of realizing I wanted to resign and I wanted to leave New York and come to Tulsa. I didn't know exactly what that was going to look like or what was on the other side, but I knew that's what I had to do in that moment. So can I ask about the reaction of friends or family when when you've got such a, um, you, you have so many accolades and you've reached a certain stature of, you know, in, in life, um, and at a very young age, you know, you of what you accomplished, were people like, what are you doing? Why would you leave? What, you know, or what were people's reactions to that? Thankfully, I had done the inner work to be able to speak from a 
deeper place about the decision. And if I had not done that inner work, I think people would have been very confused and I wouldn't have been able to express myself. But thankfully, I was able to explain to you kind of what I just said. Mm -hmm. And it really resonated with people. And I remember having specifically conversations with the editor in chief of GQ and the editor in chief of Architectural Digest, two people who I really respect and the most senior people I worked with. And both of them were the biggest encouragers of of all and they they saw the vision and they were so happy for me and they were um, sad to see me go appreciated my contributions but they felt it I think they felt it because I was able to approach them with again vulnerability and authenticity okay I've got to definitely check that book out yeah, yeah. it's pretty powerful there's something to be said about people getting on a treadmill and just kind of keeping blinders on mm-hmm. to different feelings and just continuing and pushing and pushing, pushing through, pushing through. But when you stop and take a breath and really start to consider things, mm-hmm. it's I think things kind of catch up with you, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm glad you mentioned that resource because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that are feeling similarly yeah. in their situation. Um, and so maybe that will give them a little clarity in um, their own search, you know, for for where they need to be in life. Um, so I do want to move on because I want to hear what you're currently doing in Tulsa, and it's with Experience Tulsa, and it's pretty cool. But if you would kind of share a little bit about what Experience Tulsa is and your role, and um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So when I got back here, I I sort of been a free agent for the past year, which has been its own interesting challenge for me because I do think I thrive more so with structure and I'm used to structure having been in the corporate world for a while and um, all that so the past year has been a huge growth period for me in general pulling the carpet out from underneath myself in terms of job city all that kind of stuff and and also the idea of coming back to your hometown after you've been away in the big city is not easy there's definitely a nice foundation for you but you know, Tulsa's changed a lot since I left. And I found it was very important to me to respect all the players who are already here and doing things and what they've built. And also having a sense of humility, too, that I don't know everything, even though I've had these experiences in New York and at these big places. This is a new market for me now. And I want to link and build. I want to help people elevate, but with respect and humility. So that's been something that I've had to work through because I think I was feeling a a bit off about some stuff and someone spoke some truth into me about the idea of entitlement subconsciously that was potentially holding me back. This idea of I deserve this because of where I've been. And I needed that truth spoken into me because all of this happens on a subconscious level. It wasn't like I felt that consciously, but there were some moments where I was like, why aren't people just getting it that I had the answer here, Um, you know? Or I deserve that opportunity, and that is such a trap. And again, humbling yourself. And the person's advice to me was, pretend like you're an NBC page again and you're starting from the bottom. The cream rises to the top, but you need to go about it the right way. So that was a really good reset for me. Um, But to go back to your question, Experience Tulsa. This is a group that has been created to help attract people to Tulsa and also keep them here. So it started out as a group that does high-touch visits to Tulsa when companies are exploring moving here or individuals that the city is trying to attract they will provide a high touch experience for them and connect them with the right people. It's expanded into a group that works on retention by creating community events and opportunities for people to connect and feel connected to the community of Tulsa because you can imagine moving here is not an easy thing. And so they help facilitate a lot of that connection. And then where I come in is I've proposed to them a few special projects, one of which is our Best of Tulsa series, 
um, having been a talent booker myself and having worked in social media earlier in my career, I kind of combined both of those things with this series that we created where we go around and we interview local legends, Tulsa icons, celebrities who are from Tulsa. And the intention is really to uplift local voices. I think there's not enough of that here. Um, and to raise our self-esteem locally. We have so much going on. We have so many great places. I call it a citywide gratitude practice because I think we need to appreciate what we have. Oftentimes here, I hear people say, we don't have this, we don't have that. You know, we're falling behind here, here and there. I'm more of the mindset of let's shine light on the bright spots. And I think it's really powerful to hear from Tulsans themselves in their own words, especially ones who have gone on to do amazing things um, or just who have become community staples. So we like to feature a mixture of those people and we create, as you mentioned earlier, these 90 second clips where we ask people their favorite restaurant, bar, hidden gym, Tulsa hot take, my favorite question. And it's really just about giving people a platform to talk about our city. And we've been able to optimize them to reach large audiences, which was part of my goal, because I think, you know, in this age where local media and media in general has just become very disjunctured, there are few platforms where we can bring people together and get on the same page about stuff and you just spread spread positive messages. So we were able to use social media to meet people where they're at and and do that. And I think I was told the other day that we've just surpassed 4 million views. And why I'm proud of that is that we've done that on zero production budget. So just me, my partner Mackenzie, who films on an iPhone, and we edit together and we just ask people to participate. And so that's what's come of it. So oh, that's, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. That it, I love seeing them, and I'm going to have to talk to you after about maybe getting some phone numbers or emails because you're <laughs> you're talking to when you say like the cream of the crop, the uh, these movers and shakers who have been in Tulsa, who continue to come back, who have family here, who are you know here in the city. I'm I'm talking about Amber Valletta, but did you graduate from high school with Amber? She's a little bit older than me. Okay, so Amber but she Valletta, looks young because she's a, yes, a timeless beauty. She is a timeless beauty. Uh, but Kristen Chenoweth, I mean, you are talking to the just all of these people who continue to say great things about Oklahoma and being from Tulsa. And I always am so proud when I hear them say something about, you know, positive about Oklahoma and mm -hmm. them being proud of being from our state. Yeah. You know, I always appreciate that. But yeah, but you're I you're talking that. to all these great great people for sure so do you have a favorite person you've talked to or something that somebody said that surprised you i of course love all the big celebrities that we have on but the local voices i think are my favorite i think about alberta bert from queenies who many of us grew up with and being able to kind of give her her flowers Aww. and i think about big fish over at mercury lounge the bouncer over there who's episode I think is about to surpass Kristen Chenoweth. So it just shows you giving the right people a platform to speak authentically and share their heart can really resonate. And I think Muriel, who who was a who was a guest on your podcast, yes. the illustrator behind Strawberry Shortcake and all that, she was one of my favorite guests. I, I don't think many people knew that she lived here or knew that who she was. And at the end when she's like, I created Care Bears and Strawberry Shortcake, <laughs> everyone's kind of like, what? <laughs> you know? So that one served a kind of dual purpose of letting people know that she existed and she how amazing she is while also spreading her messages about Tulsa. Yeah. We, we talked about her, but she is absolutely delightful. She's a sharp lady and extremely positive. Mm -hmm. Just, Yeah. She's, we're lucky to have her here in Tulsa, for sure. So, uh, in wrapping up, I have a theme for my podcast, and it's Grow More in 2024. So, I'm wondering, I almost could guess, but what you would say how you're growing either personally or professionally this year. 
I'm pushing myself to pursue the ideas that I have that are more closely attached to my passions and doing that without holding on to an outcome as a, again, a recovering hyperachiever, I'm very focused on outcomes typically and optimizing a certain outcome. And I want to push myself to follow my passions more. I, I took a step in the right direction on that front this past year. I enrolled in a adult beginner's tap class at Miss Shelley's and pushed myself out of my comfort zone there and did something I've always wanted to do, which is take a tap class. It was not easy for me, but those types of decisions are what I want to be doing more of. I, I absolutely love that, <laughs> that you're doing that and pushing yourself and doing things that you genuinely are interested in doing. So whether it's a tap class or, you know, whatever it is, I love that you are figuring that out now at this stage in your life, that you're not 50 plus years old. You're, yeah. you're figuring it out a little younger than a lot of people, which is so exciting. And I'm so glad, you know, that you're able to share that with people. But um, it it's a journey for sure, you know, getting to the heart of, following your your passion mm -hmm. and anyway i appreciate you so much joining me today this has been a lot of fun getting to know you and because i really didn't know you other than through the lens of social media mm. and so you are so much deeper than what i had in mind and this has just <laughs> been an awesome conversation so i appreciate you. you that's one of my other goals is to put myself out more authentically on social media Okay, yeah. That's not easy for me. Okay. Well, you you come across very well, and you are genuinely interested in the people that you're talking to, and you have such an easy vibe about you. I think like your dad, I didn't mention before, but you're, you know, your dad is David Life SD, who I've had on the podcast. He's very easy to be around. You have that same kind of demeanor, mm -hmm. um, and that comes across, I think, uh, through social media, for sure. Oh, thank you. Yeah, you didn't ask me the question about what it was like to grow up with a therapist father. You know what? I didn't think you. I didn't think you even looked at these questions. So I did. I, it's funny. Uh, okay, do you want to do you want to share that? Ironically, growing up with a father who was a therapist, especially one like my dad, who's uh, very charismatic and well loved, and all that has allowed me to be more in touch with a lot of these ideas that I've found later in life but it maybe just took me a little longer to get there. Mm -hmm. But um, I do appreciate all the work my, my dad has done through the years, committed to his work as a therapist and how many lives he's changed. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a pretty awesome example to grow up with. Yeah, but at the same time, I think I was just afraid of being seen probably. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I didn't know who I was, and I felt like maybe he could see me, and that felt scary. Mm -hmm. So... Mm hmm. Well, and he he's one that I mean, you probably hear this, but I feel like he's your biggest cheerleader because when and I'm sure I don't know your mother. I hadn't had the opportunity to meet her. But um, when I have visited the, the few interactions I've had with your dad, he is so proud of you and your sister. And I haven't met your sister either, but you could just hear the pride in his voice. Um, about his kids, and mm -hmm. so it, it's a treat to meet you and, and see you know who who you're a part of. I could definitely tell you're David's son just through mannerisms and and different. That's things. what I hear. Yeah, yeah, and that's a compliment. That's a compliment. <laughs> Thank well, you. thanks so much for joining me today. I appreciate it so much. I'm excited to share this podcast episode, and I'm going to check that book out. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you, Nancy. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. I appreciate you being here. And don't forget to connect with me on social media. Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn are at Sharing Passion and Purpose. And Twitter is at Passion Sharing. Thanks so much, and I'll see you next time.